So you know that my goal this season is to introduce you to as many fellow medical disruptors as I can. And boy, did I find one today. We are about to discuss BHRT, Bioidentical Hormone Replacement Therapy, Hashimoto's, mold, and everything in between. But the best part about this particular podcast is how much fun we had on it. Amy is a fellow nurse practitioner. She's certified in both women's health and functional medicine. She is a breast cancer survivor who turned her own personal struggle into a passion for helping others heal and optimize their physical and emotional health. And somewhere along the line, we realized that we should probably call ourselves the angry NPs, but you're going to see why in a moment. I hope you enjoy this one. Amy, I am so excited that you're here. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm so excited. to Thank you so much for having me. Uh, yeah, it looks like very dark where you are. Where are you? Are you like... Uh... I'm in Minnesota. Okay. Is it dark there right now? It's getting dark. Okay. Her right now. Good I darker. just think the part of it's still like no, you have like a room isn't great, but live like vampire vibe. No, your face is very well lit, and then back it's like it was like mystical vibe. I'm down for it. I'm yes. like, yes, I'm here for it. <laughs> I'm not a dark person, I promise. But no, I don't think anyone <laughs> on this side of the vortex is dark. It's not possible. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of the vortex, you know, this season is all about introducing the world because we're like international to all that's available out there and other medical disruptors like myself. So tell us a little bit about how you got into this crazy world. What were you before you were crazy and how did you become crazy? Ah, great question. So I am a nurse practitioner. I've been in practice for 17 years. I am very conventionally trained. My primary certification is in women's health. So I spent 14 years working in OBGYN. About four years into practice, I was actually diagnosed with breast cancer myself. Mm. And so I was 28 at the time. So okay. very, yeah, yeah, very young. So very big shock to the system. I did all of the conventional treatment. I had a mastectomy. I did chemo. I followed everything that my doctor told me to do. And I did a bunch of genetic testing and everything came back normal. So I was just told it was a fluke. I had no family history at all. So I was just kind of expected to just do my treatment and go on living my life. But actually, a friend who the year prior was diagnosed with bladder cancer mm. had sent me a book called Anti-Cancer, which was all about foods and the power that food can have what? as medicine. Food? Imagine okay. that. Exactly. <laughs> I'm hanging up. <laughs> so I had many sleepless nights after my mastectomy. And so I started reading the book and was really just blown away that, I, and honestly, I, that I had never learned any of that. And I was pissed. And so that really sent me on this rabbit hole, really starting with nutrition first, because at 28, I was terrified and I thought, I want to do everything that I can within my power to try to prevent this from happening again. Because yeah. if it does come back, I didn't want to have any regrets, right? So it started with my diet. I actually went vegan two weeks into my chemo treatment. And I remained vegan for four years. And for those four years, it served me. It eventually stopped serving me. And so I had to make some changes. But so, you know, once you start going down these rabbit holes, it, it started with diet and then it went into like the toxins and the chemicals that we're exposed to. The and vortex. The vortex, exactly. And I just went down vortex after vortex <laughs> and really started to change how I lived my life. And then that started to translate into the care that I was giving for my patients. And so even just very basic things in the beginning, like, hey, maybe let's eat less sugar and eat less, you know, processed foods and not drink so much soda or pop, as we call it here in Minnesota. And like, maybe try a few supplements or something, you know, mm -hmm. and I actually started like my patients started to they were responding really well to the suggestion. And they started to feel better. And I was like, <laughs> wow, there's imagine that there's to this. This never gets old. I know, right? And so, you know, Vortex after Vortex brought me to the Institute of Functional Medicine. And so in 2018, I started doing like official training with them, became certified in 2021. And in 2021, that's when I decided I could just no longer stay in conventional. Yeah. Practice. And so I left and now have my own functional practice. Wow. So you describe what just about every single guest I have, myself included, on this 
And it's like, I started in conventional medicine. Everyone says, and then with the exception of one guest who did it just because it academically interested her, everyone else is either sick themselves yeah, or has someone that they love. For my case, it yep. was my wife. Yep. And then you just go down the rabbit hole because you want to save yourself or your loved one. Yep. And you're like, and then somebody opens the door and says, hi, let's show you what you never learned. And you're like, it's crazy because then you go into a room, right? The thing about Institute of Functional Medicine is that everyone there is conventionally trained. Mm -hmm. There are no lay people in there. There are right. people, everyone there went to school, MD, DO, PA, NP. You can't come in without it. So you all people who spent years studying conventional medicine. And something happened in their life that said, oh, what's behind door number three? Yeah. And it's, I remember, I'm sure like at first you're like, oh my God, there's other people here. And now I just know I'm crazy. But like at first you're like. <laughs> just embrace our crazy now. And yeah, now I'll just, yeah, it's, it's fine. Now I say, <laughs> if I'm a quack, you can, you know, whatever you can, I'm quacking. It's fine. Yeah. Um, I'm a duck, <laughs> whatever it takes. There you go. Um, it's fine. Meanwhile, we're fixing people. It's great. And I also appreciate being conventionally trained because yes. I have my feet firmly in both worlds. Sometimes, like in your case, you certainly needed a mastectomy. Yeah. I mean, there's no question that we need both. It's not an either or conversation. Exactly. Exactly. But just like there's not an either or conversation to be only holistic, it's not either got to be only conventional. Mm -hmm. The part that's missing. Oh my God. Okay. So and I do, yeah. you know, the kind of person who comes into my office, they're coming because they know that something's different. And a lot of them, so a lot of them do come in and they're very anti conventional system, anti big pharma, anti pharmaceuticals, and they just, they don't want anything to do with it. And I have to have the conversation of, look, I can't promise you that I will 100% be able to get you off of your thyroid medication, off of your blood pressure medication, off of your diabetes medication. Sometimes the damage has been done. And also sometimes we need those tools. I always explain we have a lot of tools in the toolbox for a reason. It's all about choosing the most appropriate tools for your situation. Yes. And sometimes that involves pharmaceuticals and there's nothing wrong with that. 100% correct. I yes. love that. I love that. 100% correct. Okay, so, and then the other thing that happens, <clears throat> which you described as well, is you try to bring it into your practice and you try to like, well, I can do this here and you can't. There's not enough time. There's not enough reimbursement. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work, unfortunately. I have not seen anyone. You have to make this decision like to jump ship. So then you jump ship and now yep. you're doing only functional medicine. Women's health functional or... I do. I do both. Um, because my background was so strongly in women's health, and that's kind of in my community, what I have been known for, I still do a lot of hormone replacement therapy, you know, in perimenopause and, and menopause. So that is still a big piece of my practice. I just do it differently. And I have more time to have conversations with people of it's not just here's your prescription for your hormones. It's here's the education you need about the safety of these hormones, because that's a big controversial topic, right? It's not and really also, controversial. Well, it's not, you know, for us, it's <laughs> controversial, but in the lay public, it is still very controversial. I know, right? I still have patients telling me that their regular doctor told them that hormones are not safe and that they can't take them. I still have patients telling me my sister thinks that I'm crazy for being on hormones. And I would say, does your sister have a medical degree? Does your sister <laughs> prescribe hormones? Also, has your sister menopausal yet? <laughs> Stop <laughs> listening to your sister. <laughs> Listen to the one who has back. studied this yeah. for Wait 17 years. Oh my God, let's take a moment here to talk about B BHRT, I'm assuming we're talking about. Yeah, yes, okay, yes. Bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, if anyone is listening. Yes. And I want you to talk to me about BHRT. I'm sure we do it slightly different, but conceptually it's the same. And in my, in my, unless there's a contraindication and there's not as many as we think. Correct. I don't think you could talk the longevity game, the Alzheimer prevention game. Yes. I don't think you could speak that game unless you're on BHRT. Like it's non-negotiable. Right. Tell yeah. me, tell me. Yeah, it's, you know, the big study in 2002, the Women's Health Initiative that came out that really scared everybody off of their hormones. What nobody knows and what the media didn't cover is in 2019, I believe it was, almost all of the major societies came out against study. And we since know that the data from that study is very flawed. And I think that there's so many misconceptions out there. People don't understand what, you know, the difference between bioidentical versus synthetic. Think that bioidentical. And dosing, they don't, they think that bioidentical means you have to use a cream and that your insurance isn't going to cover it. And that is, you know, so far from the truth. Insurance covers 
estradiol, which is bioidentical in oral form or patch form. And insurance also covers micronized progesterone or prometrium, which is bioidentical progesterone. And these things are game changers. If you talk to any woman who starts on hormone replacement therapy, they will tell you, especially once you get the dosing correct, life-changing life in terms of their symptoms. And then we also have that educational conversation around not only can this help with all of the symptoms that you're struggling with, but yes, it, we know that it can decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease. We know that it can decrease your risk of Alzheimer's. We know that estrogen has been proven to actually decrease the risk of breast cancer. <laughs> and what I tell my patients, now my situation is a little different. I had a hormone negative breast cancer, right? but even as a breast cancer survivor, I 100% intend to use hormones when I go through menopause. I am already at 41 and in perimenopause on bioidentical progesterone, and I use testosterone therapy yes. myself as a breast cancer survivor because my quality of life is better with that. Well, after I said, you know, this is like, it, it's really, really simple. You've had these things in your life all the time. You've had progesterone, yes. you've had estrogen all your life. This is why you've been functioning. And suddenly you don't have it. And you know, maybe a generation or two ago, you went out to pasture or you died 10 years later. But now you are golfing at 60, you're traveling at 70, you're living your best life, you don't want to fall and break your bones. And so all we're talking about is replacing what was already there, not passing, not surpassing, like yeah. just replacing what you have because all that stuff was keeping you young. It was, keep, it was protecting your bones, it was protecting your heart, it was protecting your brain. So what do you think happens to you when it's gone? Like it's... Ah. Well, and the argument I always hear from patients is, you know, well, isn't menopause natural? Well, so shouldn't we just let our bodies live without hormones? And to some degree, that is correct. correct. Menopause is a natural thing. But, you know, an appendicitis is also a very natural thing. Should we just let people die from an appendicitis? And tooth no. abscesses and cellulitis and all that. Exactly. Like so many things that we, you know, struggle with are natural things, but we love the technology and the tools to help us live longer and better. And so if we can do that in a safe, effective way, why wouldn't we? I love that answer. Exactly right. Because we're also living longer because of technology. Yes, yes right? so exactly. Because we know a, about heart health and because of all, and because we're not dying from an infection, we're living longer. So the technology that's saving you is also the technology that can help you with longevity. You know, before you didn't, you were going to die. Yes. Oh my God, loving this. I mean, I personally prefer compounding pharmacies, but I'm loving your approach because it's also more accessible. I do both. I do both. I outline all of the options for my patients because I have some patients who are actually extremely sensitive to the effects of hormones. Now, there's usually deeper stuff going on that we have to work on. Fair. And so if I start a woman on an estrogen patch and she has, you know, crazy side effects, we look at how is your body processing that estrogen curve? You know, perhaps there are what I call kinks in the hose that we have to try to unkink. You don't ever have that conversation with your conventional doctor. No, first of all, I, this is where I struggle. I'll see people in my conventional because I still have a conventional medicine practice yeah. I'm there once a week, but I'm still there. And yeah. I'll say to them, they're like, well, what can I do? I'm like, well, you need to go talk to your gynecologist. And they're like, well, what are they going to say? I'm like, they're going to tell you, you can't have hormones. And like, <laughs> why are you sending me? I'm like, because I have to send you. you I have, know. You have to do your own research. Oh, yeah. it's, it's really baffling. And then if, in my functional medicine a kind of coaching, I encourage people to have this conversation. But I've just been coaching one and she has hit a roadblock. She lives in Massachusetts. She has hit a roadblock. No one will prescribe it for her. No, her no one will prescribe her. She's yeah. also like close to that 10 year mark. But then ah, they yes. know about the 10 year mark. Right, right, let me not give them that much credit. Yeah. But they were, and so it's just an access to care issue. Yeah. So the, you're just like standing in the way. And she's like, I'll sign whatever you want. Like, I, I just, and by the way, the only one, she only wants to start on progesterone right now because this poor woman is not sleeping. She's not even talking about estrogen. Progesterone. Just give her progesterone. She's not even talking about that. And then we said, because she has a 10-year mark, for anyone listening, right, there's this conversation of like how long from menopause is it safe? And so we've outlined, like, start her on progesterone and then we'll get a full cardiovascular workup. Yes, yes. And then what? Absolutely not. Oh, my gosh. Crazy. Well, and that's why, you know, I currently have a nine-month waiting list in my practice. And that's why. And that's why. That's and that's why, because so many women are not given the correct information. They are denied 
you know, prescriptions for hormone replacement therapy. So they are out there seeking other options. Yeah, it's crazy. And I'm glad you mentioned testosterone because a lot of women are like testosterone. I want testosterone. Like you have testosterone. Yes. You always had it. Well, not yes. always, but you have it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You have it. And then when it's gone, that's not just libido. It's focus. It's your career. It's yes. And it's your get up and get shit done. Yes. I would say more than the libido and the sexual, you know, piece of it when I have my women on testosterone, it's they describe their energy and their drive and their motivation to get things done. Yeah. So you reach for those of you who are in careers, you reach the top of your career and then all of a sudden you don't give a shit. And you're like, yeah, what happened? Yeah. That's that's a chemical imbalance. You need Exactly. And I see some women in my practice who are my age 41, early 40s, and sometimes even in their 30s, where they literally have like no testosterone, like less than Zero. three. Yeah, less, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, how are they functioning? Those are the women that actually I find benefit the most. They mm. notice the most symptom mm. improvement. When you take them from nothing to something, they yeah. are on top of the world. You know, I'm glad you mentioned symptoms. I'm, I'm loving this conversation. Yeah. I have a list of questions. They're out the window. Okay. I love this yeah. conversation with you. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned symptoms because on the one hand, there are some things that there are symptoms. I mean, yeah. symptom improvement. Testosterone yeah. is one of them. Vaginal estrogen is one oh of them. Oh, my that You can have sex or, you know, with your partner yeah. without crying. That's yes. immediate. Yes. Progesterone helps you sleep. A hundred percent. But And anxiety. It's a calming. And anxiety. Hormone. It's calming. Yep. A hundred percent. But then there are also benefits because some people are like, well, I've never had hot flashes and my vagina doesn't hurt and I'm feeling great. God bless. But you still need it. Yes. <laughs> Tell yes. us about that. There is not enough education for women. I have said for years before I started any functional medicine training, I would think as women, you know, when we're kids in an elementary school, what do they do? They separate the girls from the boys. And we watch the videos and we learn all about our period and what's to come. Right. By the age of 35, it should be mandatory that every woman has gone through some sort of perimenopause class to teach us about these things. Maybe when you renew your license, you have to get Yeah. <laughs> I love that idea. Yes, because it, it is so vitally important because the number of women that I see, they don't understand it anything about their hormones. No. They don't understand the physiology of their menstrual cycle. When I start to talk to them about how to eat and how to exercise in the, the different phases of your menstrual cycle, mind-blowing to them. When I say something like, have you ever noticed that your workouts just aren't as good in those last two weeks before your period? It's like a light bulb goes yeah. off. Like, oh my oh. gosh. So <laughs> there's just not an understanding of what the three hormones primarily, right? Estrogen, progesterone, testosterone actually do for us in our body. And I think if women were better educated on that, then they would be more, you know, pushing even more for hormone replacement therapy. Well, you know, as much as I love your idea that every woman should get educated on it and everyone should, Mm -hmm. I think it should be mandatory in medical school. I mean, it should be (laughs) providers to to know what they're doing. And not, yes. I mean, come on, so it's not just this is pap smears and pathology. Like, exactly. Hello. This oh, is geez. such a great example. You will die when I tell you this story. But, you know, classically trained women's health nurse practitioner. That is literally, I'm not a family nurse practitioner who just happened to work in gynecology. I am a women's health nurse practitioner. Love. I felt so unprepared to treat menopausal women when I came out of practice. And it was not just because I was a new NP. That had nothing to do with it. I remember keeping a chart at my desk with like, here are all the different products that I can use and, you know, the doses and everything. I had no clue what I was doing when it came to menopause. Yeah, I was not prepared And I want to be sure that if anyone's listening, it's not because you're an NP, because in case they have the whole NP conversation, let's correct that real quick in anybody's head. No, it is not part of conventional training. It is not. It is not part of conventional training. It is, yeah. It is, would you like an SSRI, like an anti anxiety antidepressant? Yeah. Maybe some Do you need a sleeping medication, anxiety medication. And that's, and that's about that's it. About that's it. the whole conversation. And have a nice day. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm so glad you're doing this. Like, we, we <laughs> need you out here. We need you out here. We need you out here. That's crazy. What's really fun, I had this really great conversation with a patient today that ties in really well with this. 
She is in her mid to late 60s, used hormones initially, kind of stopped for a while, has gone back on them because she just finds them very helpful. You know, vaginal dryness is a big thing for her. Now, I had prescribed some vaginal estrogen. She found that it was fairly expensive to get it covered through her insurance company. And she and her husband are just kind of no longer sexually active. They're both okay with that. So she said, I just don't see the point in in doing anything vaginally. And I said, well, do you still have the dryness? She said, oh yeah, it's like sandpaper down there. And so she assumed that because she was no longer sexually active, that there was no point in her using any kind of vaginal estrogen. And I I said, look, we can get this cream made for you. We can get it made cheaper for you so that it's not like $200. And here are all the benefits. And I told them, I have seen some very How do I politely say this? There is no polite way to say it. I have seen some nasty vaginas in my career of women who make that same assumption and then they have terrible, you know, skin itching and skin breakdown. You can get fusion of the labia and it is so painful and uncomfortable for them. And if they let it go so long, it's almost like there's a point of no return. And we can use some creams and things like that to try to get it a little bit better. But it's just a really tough situation to treat if you don't stay on top of it. And so she was like, oh, sold. Let's do it. Sold, yeah. And also, isn't there also a higher incidence of UTIs if you, this is... Yes, uh, yes. The genitourinary symptoms yeah. Like, we menopause. should take care of our vagina even if we're not having sex. I Correct. Think it time has to more of a purpose. Like, there's <laughs> other things. That. And it's still your body. And, you know... Exactly. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> Can we get that on a t-shirt? I feel like a t-shirt needs to happen. <laughs> I have many t-shirts in my practice. I'll like, we'll just add that to the we list. Like, we need a whole merch line after this. Yes, exactly. Okay. Oh my God. Okay, so we're on BHRT, but another hormone that people don't connect this hormone is your yeah. thyroid hormone. Is your thyroid Correct. hormone. Yes. Nothing works without that. Correct. And, you know, underactive thyroid, specifically Hashimoto's, is mm-hmm. like... So common. And I know you so common. Tell us about it. Yes. Yeah. I actually started screening people for Hashimoto's when I was doing back in conventional practice and doing more infertility work because there were studies coming out showing that women with thyroid antibodies would have issues, more issues getting pregnant. The problem was I would screen for it, but then I wouldn't know what to actually do with it because there was no training on that. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. I need to make sure the audience knows where we are because I'm laughing. I'm laughing. Sure. So you know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. And I want to make sure I'm in on the joke. Yeah. So here's the situation for all my listeners out here. I just did a lecture on this. It's so funny, right? So in conventional medicine, you can only test with thyroid stimulating hormone. And if you if your t- TSH is high, you need to medicate. And we're just talking about the high, the hypothyroid, yeah. right? It's high, you need to medicate. And that's kind of the only tool in this world. Yes. Yes. Well, <laughs> Amy's like, I'm going to see if they're cooking something because there is yeah. a world of pre Hashimoto's, which yes. is the thing of antibodies. Think of it yes. like pre diabetes is like pre Hashimoto's. Yes. So she's really smart and she was like, I'm going to go a step above for my patients and figure out this antibodies. This is why I'm laughing. Yeah. So she figured it out and she can say, Hey, Mrs. Smith, I just want to let you know you're about to have a thyroid problem. The problem is conventional medicine says, What do we do about it? Nothing. Nothing. Wait until you yeah, actually have a thyroid year. problem. You have a thyroid problem. Yeah, wait till you have a thyroid problem. And then Mrs. Smith is like, well, what do you mean? What do I do? And you're like, nothing. <laughs> and this is why I'm laughing because it's so frustrating. It's sad. Yes. Okay. So, so I did. I started doing my own, you know, research because I was starting to get into this world more. So back in the day, way back in the day, my only tool that I could offer them was, hey, maybe try not eating gluten. Which is you a know? pretty good tool, which is a pretty good it tool. Is. It good is. Tool. And even with just that tool, I was I would see improvements in 100%. patients' thyroid function. Now I have so many more tools in my toolbox. But the way that I describe Hashimoto's to my patients and the way that it just like pisses me off to no end is if the average person out there could get a very simple, very inexpensive blood test that said, you know what? If you don't make any changes to your diet and lifestyle, within the next 10 years, you might have MS. That would scare the crap out of people. And they would say, what can I do to prevent that? So now we have this very simple, 
very easy blood tests to do for patients that can tell them if they are kind of on the road to Hashimoto's. One, doctors usually don't do it. And if you get a doctor who actually does do it, they won't give you any sort of tools. And they just say, well, yeah, you'll probably, you know, have to end up on thyroid medication at some point. We'll just, we just have to wait until that happens. What? 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 That is not acceptable. Sounds like the exact treatment we have for Alzheimer's. Oh, you passed the mini mental. See you when you don't. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I digress. Yeah. No, that's okay. Well, tell us. Tell us. I'm, just, I'm as agitated as you are. This should be yes. called the angry NP um, <laughs> episode. Uh, Very so, much so. So tell us about the other tools that you have now for Hashimoto's. Besides yeah. The- so gluten-free is a, a big one. And I hate to make generalized statements because I do very much practice individualized medicine, right? We are all different, but I do feel like if you have those thyroid antibodies, it, most people will probably benefit from eliminating gluten 100%. in the diet. But we know, especially in this country, gluten is just so inflammatory and there is such a strong correlation between gluten and Hashimoto's. So If I have a patient who, and this is very often the case, I am the first one who has ever checked those antibodies for them. And I am giving them this brand new diagnosis. And I think, you know, another important point that we should talk about for the listeners is it is very common to have those thyroid antibodies. And if you're listening and you're curious about this, you know, what you can ask your doctor for is thyroid peroxidase or TPO antibodies and thyroglobulin or TG antibodies. It is very common for me to see that those antibodies are positive, but your actual thyroid function is normal. And I think that is the population that is kind of in this limbo that gets dismissed the most because they're told, well, it's early Hashimoto's, but your thyroid function is fine. So you don't, we don't have to do anything. You know, we'll just keep an eye on it. And once your TSH starts to climb, then we'll give you your levothyroxine, right? And that is just so not the appropriate management of these patients because there are so many things that we can do to intervene before that thyroid function ever starts to go awry, right? So I usually like to start with diet for my patients. So we work on gluten. It kind of depends on their motivation, their readiness to change, right? Because making diet changes is not an easy thing. And some of my patients find eliminating gluten quite easy. Some really struggle with it quite a yeah. bit. So so I always say start with gluten. And then I sort of give them the list of other foods that we know can potentially cause issues. And I always emphasize this list can be scary because if you break it down, it's gluten, dairy, corn, soy, sugar, eggs, nightshade vegetables, and nuts legumes. and seeds and legumes. Yeah, it's like yeah. the peanuts. And so that is a very intimidating list. Yeah. And I tell what my do you patients- want me to eat? I know. And so I tell my patients, you do not have to eliminate all of these foods. This does not mean that all of these foods are causing problems for you as an individual, but these are the things that you might want to experiment with. You know, try a few weeks without them, reintroduce, see how you feel, right? And some of my patients really just don't want to mess with that. And so sometimes we will break down and maybe do some food sensitivity testing to help give them, you know, a better kind of roadmap. So that's always an option too. So I always start with food. I start with, uh, honestly, a thorough blood panel to see what else is going on in their system. What do their inflammatory markers look like? I usually try to get them on some, you know, anti-inflammatory supplements, things like fish oil, turmeric, maybe some glutathione. Again, I don't treat Hashimoto's the same for all of my patients because everyone is different, Mm -hmm. right? So it kind of depends. But so there are various different supplements that we know can be helpful. But for me, I'm always looking at, you know, inflammation. Because right, I was going to say, I was gonna, yeah. what you're searching for is because we went right to nutrition, but I want our yeah. listeners to know what you're doing because I know what, yeah. you're doing. Yeah. what you're doing is you're saying there's inflammation going on in mm-hmm. your particular case, ma'am, that inflammation is attacking your thyroid because that's your weak spot. Somebody yep. else is attacking their skin or their joints. Yeah. And so what is the root cause of your particular case? This is where they get customized. Yeah. Start with nutrition because most people are eating the standard American diet. So you have to start exactly. there. And it doesn't make sense to go somewhere else to hunt down yeah. anything else until you figure this piece out. Yes. So, so to your point, you kind of start everyone on nutrition. What, do you, what are your other yeah. things you go for within? The other like thing is usually gut health. And so, gut health. Gut health. Yeah. yeah. Looking at the microbiome. So if I have a patient who, you know, I diagnose with Hashimoto's and she's got a bunch of GI complaints, constipation, diarrhea, gas, bloating, heartburn, all those things, then I really try to encourage them to do a functional <laughs> stool test. Belly. 
we got the inflammation it. doesn't stay in your belly it goes correct it's actually connected to things correct and i think sometimes the hard part is i will work with patients who they say no i have regular bowel movements i don't feel bloated they have no gi symptoms no gi symptoms yeah yeah and i'll still say you know what at, then maybe we don't have to focus on that right now we can work on some other things but at some point i need you to budget for that stool test because i guarantee you you don't end up with hashimotos or any other autoimmune disease without some degree of gut dysfunction and most Agreed. of our immune system lives in our gut so Agreed. that is so key. And let's say you have a lot of food sensitivities. I, in general, I would prefer to do a stool test before I do a food sensitivity I test. I think that's better practice. Sometimes I have a hard time getting patients to buy in. And so I say, they just want the roadmap of the foods. And so I say, fine, you know what, let's do that. But if you light up like a Christmas tree, we got to do that stool <laughs> test. Or a mold test. Oh, girl. So okay, so wait, let me just tell people what food sensitivity is. Food sensitivity yes. is not the same as food allergies. Or allergies, you go to your allergens, your allergist, it's what's called IgE testing. It's those, that's not this. This is not that. Yeah. 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 This is more IgG, IgA testing. There are specialized labs to do it. Your PCP is not ordering this for you. This is Correct. not the insurance. Correct. I also want to put a plug out. I don't know if I can say this or not. You can go ahead. I am not a fan of Everly Wackle food sensitivity testing. Because I, I love the direct to consumer and I love that people are getting more options. I have not found them to be very accurate. I, I feel like I everyone like has the same. Cyrex is great. I, you know, I work with patients who are in the insurance. I still actually take insurance in my current practice. So sometimes budget is an issue. So I use Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory right now. I do find that their results seem to be fairly accurate. My patients, when they remove those foods, are getting their symptoms improved. So, but Cyrex, I think, is the gold standard. For yeah, us I agree. But it is expensive. So, well. so what Amy, what you're saying is that some people really want, they're really, they're really, spare. it's like thousand dollars. It could be, it can, can get really, it can get close to about yes. dollars. And they get, and some people are great. They get this little piece of paper and it tells them these are the five things. And they're like, great, I don't have to eliminate anything. And for some people, that's beautiful. I've had those few and far between. I yes. have those. They're very lovely. It's great. Yes. Avocado, yeah. amazing. The problem is, and I always tell people before you spend your money, is that you can have every single thing light up. This is what you meant when you said light up like a Christmas tree. Yes. And when every single thing lights up, you're in trouble because you're not actually sensitive to every single food on that list. Correct. What does that actually mean? It just means that you have such a high level of what we call quote unquote leaky gut. Yeah. Right. You're a mess. You're a mess. <laughs> you're a mess. Exactly. <laughs> and what I tell people is those food sensitivities don't happen in a vacuum. I'm a big fan of analogies because I love to teach. And I think the more patients understand about what I'm trying to do with them, the more they can buy in, right? And so the analogy I use is a screen door for the lining of the gut. A screen door should be semi-permeable. Small things should be able to get through, right? But lots of different things can come along and basically cut a big old hole in your screen door. And now birds are going to fly into your house. Oh, I love that. If if one bird flies into your house, it's kind of a freaky thing, but you can get it out and you can move on about your day, right? But if you have just massive holes and you've got a wide open screen door, you're going to get lots of birds flying in your house. So then what's going to happen? You're going to freak out, right? You're going to like grab a broom. You're going to be swinging it around. You're going to knock over a lamp. You're going to break a window. You're going to hit the TV. That to me is autoimmune disease. Oh right. my God, I love, what a great metaphor. I love it. Analogy, right, metaphor, and it depends analogy. on what you're knocking over. If you're knocking, are you hitting the thyroid? Are you hitting your joints? Are you hitting like your myelin sheath? And that's MS, right? So so that's why the food piece is so important. And that's why fixing the microbiome and fixing the health of the gut is love so that. key to try to improve autoimmune issues. I love that. And so back to what we're saying, if you're really lit up, then there's another level of information, right? So we talk inflammation, we talk food, we, and we talk healing the gut. Yeah. But then there's another world where this is the world where Amy and I live in the same mentorship of crazy. Yeah. The yeah. There's this other world that says, what if there's something else? Oh my what if goodness. something else besides just you know, going gluten free and fixing the belly. Yes. And one of those things is mold. Very much so. And yeah. this one is the one that kind of blows people's minds a little bit because it is never talked about in conventional medicine. No, it doesn't ever. exist. 
you know? Correct. And so if it doesn't exist in conventional medicine, then it must not be a thing and we must all be quacks, right? Yeah. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Um, but it is a very real thing. And I will not let anybody tell me that mold illness is not a real thing until you have dealt with it in clinical practice. And you tell me that these yeah. patients are not so sick from their mold exposure. And as you yeah. start to treat the mold and you see them improve, it yeah. is phenomenal. You know what's fun? I'm just laughing because I have several well-known clinicians who bring me their loved ones on the down low. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, we're going to get them better. So yeah, yeah. No, it's real. And, and until someone in your family, God forbid, I don't wish any gets unwell, that's when you start to be, open your mind to it. And you're like, okay. Yeah. Maybe it but it's real. Yeah. And watch people get better. Yes. Objectively, you test their urine before, you test their urine yes. after. You can yes. see, like, this is objective data that you can see. It's just, it's crazy. Yes. Treating mold patients has been one of the cool, like, one of the most challenging. So right? challenging. But also one of the most rewarding parts of 17 years of clinical practice, because you truly feel like you're helping people get better. Yes. And you truly yeah. feel like it's also validating, like, because it tends to be for me that my, and I'm sure for you also, the mole patients are the ones that are so sick. They've already, oh my gosh, they've already been through, sometimes already been through functional medicine. They've already yes. been compliant with the food. They've already balanced their hormones. They're taking, like, they're doing everything right. Yes. And they're still not better. Yeah. These are I have what I call mold better. spidey senses. Yeah, and to yeah. me, I have a few things that, like, really get my brain thinking about mold. And one of them is, like, have you seen multiple different doctors, even functional medicine doctors, and nobody can really figure you out? Have you been working on your gut health for years? Yep. And you're a little bit better, but like it's like playing whack-a-mole in the yep. gut and you can't get that gut better. Do you have SIBO that just like keeps coming back and keeps coming back? Those are all, you know, some of the things that make me think about mold. So Agreed. here's my analogy that I give my patients for mold and gut health in particular. Imagine that I'm holding a silk scarf in one hand. I and, love you. Uh, I'm like imagining right <laughs> I now. I love analogies. Please. So a silk scarf in one hand and I've got like a sparkler, like a 4th of July firework sparkler in another hand. And that sparkler gets too close to that silk scarf and some of the sparks fly off and hit that silk. You can only begin to imagine like it's just going to singe it and singe a hole in it, right? That's what these mycotoxins or these mold toxins do to our gut lining. So they drive significant damage to that gut lining. They can drive significant fungal overgrowth issues. That, that's a lot of people do not realize the yeah. connection between like yeast and fungal overgrowth, especially in the gut and, and mold. And so some of my mold patients have the worst and are honestly sometimes the most constipated patients that I deal with, which yeah. is such a vicious cycle because in order to get them well, you have to get those bowels moving and yes, detoxing. and you're giving them binders and it's like such a, yes yeah. it is it can be such a challenging thing to treat but it really it is a driver of autoimmune disease now unless you know let's say i'm meeting a patient for the very first time and we're spending an hour in their console and i'm going over everything sometimes by the end of that hour with a patient i just know like i don't i'll we'll test but i don't need a test to know like i say girl this is you've got mold 100% yeah, wait, guarantee you, you've got mold. Sometimes it's not so clear and I don't always go there on the first visit, right? I agree. Because some of it is you need to develop some trust with these people before you open up that can of worms. The crazy, that is a, the crazy door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it is a big ass crazy door to open Ooh. up. And it can be life changing for these people, especially in terms of finances, if they have to remediate and oh move. And it just, it can be a nightmare. So, I'm always thinking about it when I have a patient with any sort of autoimmune disease, right? It's just I don't always go there immediately for people. I agree. I agree. I usually wait a few months because I want to. I also tell people you might have mold, but you won't be able to handle the protocol if you're belly. Correct. Correct. So no matter what, I start with the gut. Not that everything is gut, but we have to get this foundation going because, like you said, oh, the protocol is no joke. Yeah. On your belly, yeah. so you need to calm that belly down. Oh my God. And it can be this really vicious catch 22 of you're actually never going to really get their belly where it needs to be if there's still mold yes. present. But yes. sometimes you have to do at least some foundational things to get it in a better place so that they can handle some of the mold treatment that we want to bring in. I agree. I agree so much. Oh my God. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> oh my God. 
It's all we've gone all over the place. And, and also, can't, like, I feel like we're talking to you for five minutes, but like, I have to give you a thing. I know. Um, okay. Okay. Is there anything that you want to tell our listeners that I have forgot to ask you? Oh, yes. I would say this applies more to the Hashimoto's piece and I think the mold piece, the autoimmune piece, but, and I'm sure you've come across this too. There's so much that we can do with diet, with supplements. And we can get people moving in a really good direction. The one thing that I consistently see holding my patients back, and I've been there too, it's held me back too. I always tell my patients, you name it, other than chronic Lyme, and I'm going to knock on wood, you name it, I have dealt with it. Mold, gut issues, autoimmune stuff, all of it. Why I'm so passionate about helping people with these things. But it is the mental, emotional, trauma, stress. Yes. You're going to do this to me in the last few minutes? You're going <laughs> to bring this topic up? We might need to have yes. a part two. Oh, yes. But like, say now we can't say more. So it, most people, they get the diet. They get the supplements. They don't always connect the trauma, right? They don't understand, you know, this is all physics, right? Energy cannot be created or destroyed. So you experience that trauma, you experience anger, you experience bitterness, resentment, all of that. You don't release that from your body. You don't learn how to process that. It just gets stuck in here yeah, yeah, and it yeah. will manifest in some sort of symptom or disease for you. A hundred percent, it will. And the trauma of also being so chronically ill. Yes. Not believed for a while. That's its own trauma. But then also yes. the believing also that you're stuck in this chronic illness. Yes. It's very hard to undo that piece as well. And that, we, yes, I'm glad you mentioned it because we do work on that concurrently with our patients also because sometimes you see them doing everything right and they're just stuck in unwellness. And I have this one patient and she's, she got so well and she said, I honestly have to redefine myself because there used to be a time where I could say, well, I can't go to this event because I'm yes. well, and now I have to come up with another reason not to go to this event. But she's grappling with it also in the role of her family, like her husband was the caretaker. Now she can be independent. It's creating situations. Now she was wonderfully verbal about it and she's in a great environment where she could talk about it. But for not everyone has such a clear handling of that. Yes. And that fear of changing it. Yes. Sometimes it gets you stuck exactly where you are. Yes. And the literature supports, you know, we have this thing called the adverse child events, you know, survey. And the higher you score in terms of your adverse childhood events, it is cool. There's a clear correlation between chronic illness as an adult. Right. And I think that trauma often sets patients up in this victim mindset. And I'm yeah. sure you have seen that too. And I have patients who I work with who I, they are completely stuck in that victim mindset. And that is actually energetically, yeah. subconsciously keeping them sick and, and preventing I just them say, from like, getting well. Victim mindset doesn't mean they're not aware of it. These are high Correct. power people, high functioning yes. people. These are not people who are like staying home saying, oh, what was me? Yes. But they're actually, some of them are overachievers as a result of this victim mindset because they got to yes. keep going and they have to be this and that. And like they don't yes. understand that is coming from a place also of Right. It's not it's like overcompensation. Yes. So I'm so glad you brought that up for our listeners there, because that's a piece. And that is why what you do and what I do with other medical disruptors. Um, is so customized, if you're going somewhere yes. and everyone's walking around with the same 30 day protocol, okay. you're not in the right place, you're not in the right place. Correct. And if somebody says this is my Hashimoto's protocol. If somebody yeah. says, this is my mold protocol, I mean, I generally, it, you know, when we're treating mold, we're using kind of some sure. of the same supplements, sure. but I have all of my patients are doing something different subtly things. different depending yes. on their situation and their needs. And their tolerance. And, that's a, and their tolerance. Oh my gosh, their tolerance. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> don't yeah. even get me started on that. Some, people some, are like, what? some <laughs> mold patients, some autoimmune patients. They simply cannot tolerate even some no. basic supplements that we need them to be able to take in order to get well. 
And those are the patients who have to do this. You know, we call, I call them brain retraining for my patients. Yes. Technically, the term is yeah. limbic system retraining. Yeah. You have got to get out of fear. I'm working with a patient now who is working with her primary, trying to get her blood pressure under control. She's got something called mast cell activation syndrome. So mm -hmm. she's very highly reactive. She doesn't always tolerate supplements well. And she is afraid to try a certain class of medications because she has read that they can flare mast cell. Even though I had said, you know, I have posted about her in the mentorship group and multiple providers have said, we have our patients on the, this class of medications and a lot of them do well. And I had to message her and say, if what you're doing now isn't working, ask your primary about this class of medications, but you're going to have to do some yeah, limbic work on work. that because if you are afraid that you're going to react, you, you react. likely will react. The yeah. mind is a very powerful thing. And I don't think patients fully understand the mind-body connection and its importance to healing. That oh has become God. a lot of what I talk about with my patients. It's become a lot of what I'm passionate about. I do this work too. I do consider myself to be a pretty intelligent person, very driven, very type A. I recently, as part of one of the limbic system retraining programs that I'm doing myself, you know, I had to ask my gut, what do you need from me? And my gut said, let go. Wow. And I have personally been realizing that a lot of my health issues, a lot of my issues in my life in general are all around control. And I'm constantly grabbing onto everything well, like this. And I just need to like work on just wow. letting go. I didn't know you were going to like attack me personally at the end <laughs> of the podcast. <laughs> so rude. Okay. Okay, sis, that's a good There will one. be no part two. Clearly, I'll never be asked. <laughs> my God, so awesome. Okay. But, and I share these things with yeah. my patients so that they know, look, I am you too. Yes. I have my own struggles. I think there's this perception that we have these great lives and, you know, lives and we're yeah. so healthy and I struggle too. I'm sure you have your struggle. We all Absolutely. have our struggles. Absolutely. And it's not, it, 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 it so makes us better. I was yes. just telling someone that I had to have an endoscopy this morning and I'm very nervous before procedures. Sure. And this person was really good with me. And I said, you, I said, you know, this nervousness makes me a better clinician because when my patients come in and say, I'm really nervous about a blood test. And I don't say, well, whatever, get over it. It's just a blood test. Blood test. I'm like, OK. And we work around it. Sometimes we medicate for it. Yeah. But because you experience it, you're a better provider. A hundred percent. I don't know how. I could effectively treat. I just can't imagine my life as a provider without having gone through Agreed. all of my own Agreed. struggles. When, with my wife and with myself, I agree. Because now you were in it, you're in it 100%. Yeah, I've been where you are where at. You are. Okay, yeah. You're not allowed to talk more because you brought up the whole central nervous activation. You brought up mast cell activation in the last five minutes. You brought up all these topics. Each one of these deserves a song. So now you have to come Oh back. my gosh, yes. <laughs> these are all very complex <laughs> topics that we are just all... skimming the surface of. The last five minutes. Okay. Okay. This is awesome. I haven't had such a high energy podcast in a long time. Oh, good. Oh, oh I'm glad. so okay. good. Yeah. It's just so good. Okay. We're going to have to do a part two and a part three. So obviously we're going to reach Love out it. to this. Anytime. Yes. Um, this is amazing. How can people find you? I yeah. know you have a waiting list, so they're not taking, but maybe, I don't know if you're... Yeah, so oh. the best way would be probably my Instagram handle. It's just Amy Newman underscore MP. Amy is actually A-I-M-E-E. -E. I am part French. Newman is N-E-U-M-A-N-N. -N. Throw in the German um, <laughs> underscore N-P. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm um, put so the links in, of, of course. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for being here. You're oh, just you're so lovely. welcome. This was you a treat. A I loved it. <laughs> yeah, this was awesome. You get two angry NPs together and look at what happens. <laughs> Who are laughing the entire time through exactly. anger. Exactly. <laughs> that's how angry we are. Yes. <laughs> okay. But that's how I think we're both very passionate and it yeah. shows. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's an honor to share this profession with you. Oh, thank you. I agree. Okay, thanks. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.